Welcome to the Institute of Science and Technology's AI Special Interest Group online seminars, introduced by me, Richard Saldana. These seminars aim to explore a wide range of AI-related topics with invited experts, everything from algorithms and applications to ethics and AI explainability. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Philippa Duckett from UCL to you today. Philippa is currently studying for a PhD at UCL, working on the tracking of particles produced in proton-proton collisions in the Large Hadron Collider, LHC, at CERN. Her work focuses on the novel use of machine learning methods to improve the speed and quality of charged particle track reconstruction in the Atlas detector, one of two general purpose particle detectors in the LHC. Philippa attended Jesus College, University of Oxford, and was awarded a first class honors MPhys master's degree in physics in 2021. She specialized in particle physics in her master's research project, where she focused on the analysis of particle decays at the LHC. The Large Hadron Collider is one of the most complex machines ever built by human beings. Its aim is to explore the fundamental building blocks that make up our universe by colliding protons at close to the speed of light, thereby converting this energy into showers of subatomic particles. I'm looking forward to what will surely be a fascinating seminar on particle track reconstruction aimed at identifying the most promising LHC collision events for downstream analysis. Philippa. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming and thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, as, as Richard said, I'm going to discuss the methods used for reconstructing tracks left by particles at the Large Hadron Collider. But first, I'm going to give some background to motivate why we actually want to do this and why we want to construct those tracks at all and why it's so difficult to do that. And then I'll discuss the current reconstruction process in detail and finally some of the work that my group are doing at UCL. So onto the standard model. So CERN's main focus is particle physics, which is the study of the fundamental constituents of matter. So for questions like, how many are there? How do they interact? What are their properties? But the physics studied is much broader and it ranges from nuclear to high energy physics. Particle physicists describe the fundamental structure of matter using the standard model. So the model describes how everything that they observe in the universe is made from a few basic building blocks called fundamental particles governed by four forces. It's currently the most successful and widely accepted model in particle physics. So the model consists of two types of particles, fermions and bosons. So we've got fermions are all the building blocks of matter. So those include quarks and leptons. So the up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom quarks, and then the electron, muon, tau and their respective neutrinos. And then you have bosons, which are the force carriers, and those include the photon, the W and Z bosons and the gluon. And then the photon mediates the electromagnetic force, W and Z mediate the weak nuclear force, and gluons the strong nuclear force. The standard model describes the interactions of these particles through the exchange of these force carrying bosons. The model also predicts the existence of the Higgs boson, which gives particles mass and was observed for the first time at the Large Hadron Collider in 2012. Over the years, it's explained many experimental results and precisely predicted a range of phenomena, such that today it's considered a well tested theory but it does have some limitations. So basically, why are we still studying the standard model? What are the open questions? The standard model actually only describes 4% of the known universe. So some of the major unanswered questions include, what is dark matter? So observations of galaxies and the cosmic microwave background radiation suggest that 96% of the matter and energy in the universe cannot be accounted for by the standard model. So dark matter makes up 26% 26 of the universe and is thought to be made up of particles that don't interact with light or other electromagnetic radiation, but the exact nature of these particles is still unknown. Another question, why, why is there more matter than antimatter? So this is known as the baryon asymmetry problem. The standard model predicts that matter and antimatter should have been produced in equal amounts during the Big Bang. But observations show that there's a significant imbalance in favor of matter. Another question is unification of forces. So the standard model only explains the strong, weak and electromagnetic forces, but it doesn't explain gravity. Will these forces be unified at higher energies as the other forces are? And also, why is gravity so much weaker than the other forces? So when you think about it, a small fridge magnet is enough to create an electromagnetic force greater than the gravitational pull exerted by Earth. So to explain the difference, we look for exotic phenomena such as extra dimensions and gravitons, um, which is possible that could be found at the LHC. And then the final question, 
is vacuum decay a possibility, um, which some people also say as what is the ultimate fate of the universe? Um, so the Higgs field is responsible for giving particles mass. If the Higgs field were at zero energy, particles wouldn't have mass. Um, but there is a local minima at the value it currently takes, which is the Higgs boson mass. Um, and current measurements actually of other phenomena suggest that there's this a lower energy state that the Higgs field could decay to. And if the Higgs field were to be able to escape its local minima that it's in, the laws of physics would be completely rewritten and look nothing like they currently do. So it's interesting to look into whether this is actually a possibility as it's currently thought to be. Okay, on to the Large Hadron Collider. So these are all of the open questions in physics. And one way to look into how whether we can answer these is theoretically. Um, but actually, the theoretical predictions give lots of options. There's not one exclusive theory. And so it's required to have experimental tests of these theories. So this motivates the Large Hadron Collider, which is the state-of-the-art particle exper physics experiment at CERN um, in Switzerland, in Geneva. And it's designed to explore the building blocks of matter and the forces that govern them by smashing subatomic particles together at very, very high speeds and observing what flies off. So the LHC consists of a 27 kilometer ring of superconducting magnets with a number of accelerating structures that boost the energy of particles along, along the way. To reduce the impact of cosmic rays, the LHC actually exists 100 meters underground and the LHC collides protons together at close to the speed of light and brings them to collision in locations known as interaction regions, which are surrounded by sophisticated detectors. During run two, which finished a little while ago, um, but that's what we're currently using the data from. The collisions were at 13 tera electron volts. The protons are grouped in 2,800 bunches of over 100 billion protons each. These branches of protons are kept on their circular paths with a magnetic field created by superconducting dipole magnets. And in run two, there are approximately 100 billion collisions per second. And this high rate of collisions is necessary since many interesting physics processes have a tiny probability to occur. Moving on just briefly to cover the experiments, although I think I've skipped slides, so I'll just wait till my laptop catches up. Um, the proton collisions are recorded and analyzed in four major experiments along the LHC. So those are ATLAS, ALICE, CMS, and LHCB. Each experiment has been built targeted at one particular aspect of the standard model. So ATLAS and CMS are the two largest detectors at CERN and their mission now mainly focuses on probing new physics through the record luminosity at the LHC. ALICE covers the studies of quark gluon plasma created in heavy ion collisions and LHCB primarily focuses on measurements of CP violation and rare decays of bottom and charm hadrons, which investigate this antimatter matter asymmetry problem primarily. The experiment that I work, work on is ATLAS, and I'll be focusing on that today. So this one's ATLAS. So uh, just briefly, the run three of the LHC started in July 2022, after more than three years of maintenance work. Um, and it's basically all the injectors have been recommissioned to operate with new higher intensity beams and increased energy. So what are the goals of run three? So now that the Higgs boson was discovered, the standard model is in a sense complete, but there's still a lot more to learn. So one goal is to probe the nature of the Higgs boson. Is it one of a kind? Is there a whole Higgs sector of particles? Does it get mass by interacting with itself in some way? In run three, we're hoping to observe previously inaccessible processes, and we'll be able to improve the measurement precision of numerous known processes. So for example, measurements of the Higgs boson decay to second generation particles such as muons will be an interesting new result, and it would confirm whether these second generation particles also get mass through the Higgs mechanism. We're also looking at new precision measurements, which hopefully pave the way to new physics. So we exploit these precision measurements to seek possible answers that either confirm or I guess dis disconfirm um, the standard model or hints or give hints of new phenomena. Most physicists expect that there should be new particles beyond the standard model, but it's unclear exactly what their properties of, would, should be. Then there's also lepton flavor universality violation, which you may have heard about, it must have been a couple years ago now, but in the previous runs of the LHC, the LHCB experiment started to see some interesting effects in some of the decays of the B mesons that it measures. The standard model predicts 
that decays involving different flavors of leptons should occur with the same probability. And this is known as lepton flavor universality. And it's normally measured by the ratio between decay probabilities. And this ratio should be very close to one in the standard model, but the LHCB experiment observed results that indicate a hint of a deviation from one, and that hints at physics beyond the standard model. So this will be investigated in REN3. And then there's also a heavy iron collision program um, that will allow experiments, particularly ALICE, to investigate the quark gluon plasma um, with unprecedented accuracy. And this figure is just a figure from CMS showing uh, characteristics from a Higgs event. So moving on to talk about ATLAS. So the ATLAS detector has dimensions of a cylinder. It's 46 meters long, 25 meters in diameter. And the detector itself has many layers designed to collect the millions of particles produced by collisions in its center. Not all particle collisions are registered and analyzed though, because there are over a billion per second. Um, so we need a sophisticated data acquisition system that's regulated by the trigger. And this is an online, i.e. at the time of collision or as close to it as physically possible, um, mechanism that selects which collision is recorded and stored. And this is important to keep the amount of data produced manageable. And so yeah, we throw away like 99.999% of all events that are generated at the LHC or at Atlas at least. So onto the bit that's more what I'm working on. So this is recording the collisions. So the ATLAS detector measures the properties of particles produced in these collisions. And this, the aim is to probe the nature of the particle interactions. So the protons are brought to collide in the center of the detector, but we can only see short-lived particles through their decay products. We can't observe them directly, and they're only around for fractions of a second. Um, so just to give a taste of how we observe some of these short some of these particles and decay products. So muons can be seen because they leave a track in the inner detector and a track in the muon spectrometer, but they don't leave energy in the calorimeters. And then the electron, an electron can be seen by tracks it leaves in the inner detector and showers in the electromagnetic calorimeter. Photons can be seen as they don't leave tracks in the inner detector because they're not charged. Um, and the showers they leave in the electromagnetic calorimeter. And neutrinos can be observed by the fact that we don't observe them. <laughs> um, so you see a neutrino by looking at the event as a whole and working out the missing momentum and missing energy and whether this is compatible with a neutrino. So another thing that is observed in these collisions are jets. So jets are collimated streams of particles and they are the signatures of quarks and gluons. And quarks and gluons are, well, quarks and gluons make up proteins. So when protons, so when the protons collide with high energy, these constituents are kicked out in all different directions and the jets are the signatures of these. So hadrons, hadrons are seen via their jets and jets are seen by tracks they leave in the inner detector and showers that they leave in the hadronic calorimeter. We'll be focusing now on tracking in the inner detector because this is what I work on. And you can kind of see from what I've just been through that a lot of the different types of particles are observed by the tracks they leave in the inner detector. So tracking is really important for identifying particles and so identifying what created these particles initially. So moving on to the detector. So there are multiple detector layers that are placed along the path of the particle. At every layer, the particle interacts electromagnetically with the material, losing a small fraction of its energy in the form of an electrical charge. And using the position of the deposited charge and a tracking algorithm, we're able to accurately recover the original track of the charged particle. Associating the different measurements together to recover a particle trajectory, trajectory is the first step towards the analysis of a collision. Um, just to go through this, so a magnetic field within the detector bends the charged particles so that we can measure their momenta. And in a homogeneous solenoidal field, a charged particle will follow a helical trajectory. However, the magnetic field in the det detector is inhomogeneous, and so you need to solve the equation of motion numerically um, to work out what the track should look like, what a particle track should look like when you find all of its parameters. And so just looking, this is the equation of motion. So P here is the momentum, Q is the charge of the particle, V the velocity of the particle, and V the field. And the field is known, it's just inhomogeneous and complex in the ATLAS detectors. So onto the actual tracking. So 
as I said before, we observe the charged particles coming out of the collisions from the curved tracks they leave when moving through a magnetic field. Tracks are determined from individual measurements known as hits left in the detector layers as the charged particles pass through. The track finding problem is to group together sets of individual hits and connect them into sequences representing tracks to figure out the particle that created them. And you might ask, well, why not just watch the particles curving? Um, but the answer is that every observation is an interaction and this disturbs the state of the particle. So we need to observe these particles as little as possible so that we can see what their actual tracks would be. So the challenge now is to track these millions of particles per event in as few as possible layers of the detector. So the challenge though with this is now we have a series of hits, so a series of basically dots on the detector, and we need to join them into tracks. So every second, 40 million events are happening at the LHC. There are thousands of tracks from up to 40 individual collisions per event. And we need to reconstruct these millions of particle trajectories per second from petabytes of raw data produced by the next gen generation detectors. detectors. So there are additional challenges, including, for example, multiple scattering. So even though the detector layers are designed to interact as little as possible with the passing particle, multiple scattering occurs along the trajectory, resulting in a deviation from the ideal path. So the energy transfer of this interaction is negligible, but the successive small angle de deviations do add a random component to the trajectory. So you're not seeing a clear trajectory, you're seeing a slightly deviated path. So looking at the current method, so at ATLAS, charged particle track reconstruction is done in four stages. So the first problem is how do we actually interpret the detector signal into points showing where the particle went through? And then there's seeding and track finding, which are difficult because there are tens of thousands of hits in the detector caused by thousands of particles. So it's difficult to work out which particles created which hits and the path of the particle. And the added difficulty is you actually don't know how many particles there are, whether they've interacted too strongly with the detectors, causing them to change their path, whether they've emitted a photon in the process, which would also change their trajectory. And they also might interact with each other. What type, what type they are, we don't know that. Um, and also whether the detector may have missed a hit, which can happen as well. So there's quite a few complexities to the problem. So first looking at going from the detector to the space points or hits. So when a charged particle passes through the detector, it leaves signals on the modules of the detector. And it is only through these signals that are all assembled together that we can reconstruct its trajectory. The passing particle ionizes the detector material, i.e. it deposits a charge, and the charge is read out by the readout channels that have been activated by the passage of a charged particle. The signals are combined into clusters, which are interpreted as deposits left by individual traversing particles. So those are called, so the, these clusters are then used to build space points that represent the single location through which the particle is assumed to have traversed the detector layer. And these space points are the beginning of the track reconstruction process. So looking at these image, you can see a particle will have passed through these pixels and that that's a cluster and then you'd find the actual location of the hit from this cluster and again this would show another particle and another particle passing through here so then we have the seeding stage so given a collection of space points we now need to group together these space points that belong to the same track and determine the track features the seeding step reconstructs the first segment of a track it's seed so looking at this so seeds are created from sets of three space points any three space points, i.e. triplets, um, that are aligned with a near helical model can be investigated, becoming a seed. The choice of having triplets as starting points comes from the fact that three points are the minimum requirement to build a helix, and any triplet that passes certain selection criteria, e.g. simple geometric requirements, such as a minimum distance between hits, are retained for the next stage. After a triplet passed the first set of predefined selection requirements in the seeding, a fourth point is then required to confirm, okay, to confirm a seed quality before proceeding to the combinatorial filtering. The seeding stage is important because the evaluation of the, of the particle trajectory through the detector and magnetic field is highly CPU intensive. Um, so ideally it's only done for track candidates that are likely to describe trajectories for particles to be found. So you don't wanna be doing it for really bad seeds. Otherwise you're just, you're wasting a lot of time. So onto track finding. 
this is maybe the most interesting stage. So seed track parameters are estimated according to the assumption that the particle has a perfect helical trajectory at the interaction region of the detector in a uniform magnetic field or thereabouts, um, if it were to be a uniform magnetic field. And then you build search roads, so sets of detector modules that can be expected to contain clusters compatible with the seed through the remaining detector based on the estimated seed trajectory. And this is done to reduce combinatorics um, and so computational time, as it only considers clusters on a subset of modules in the path of the seed. Track candidates are then created using a combinatorial Kalman filter from the particle's initial trajectory, i.e. from using the three space point seeds. The combinatorial Kalman filter is a variant on the Kalman filter, which carries out a combinatorial explor exploration of all possibilities, building all the track candidates in parallel within the search road. It determines the stat track state vector dynamically from measurements at each detector surface to estimate the track parameters and their uncertainty from a set of measurements. Kalman filtering is a well-established method for estimating the state of a system that contains lots of random variation. And this is required because there, as I mentioned before, there is a lot of noise in the detector that can lead to inaccurate or missed measurements or the part of the particles it travels through the detectors. So a little bit more detail on the combinatorial Kalman filter, but I won't go too, too in depth. So the filter takes a seed segment and the current bit of parameters, and it uses these to propagate to the next detector layer to make predictions on the location of the hit in the next layer. So you can see hit A is propagated to prediction point B. So in this equation, F is a theoretical track model for a particle in the Atlas magnetic field. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you have to solve that equation of motion to get the kind of theoretical model. And the track parameters have been determined from all previous measurements and initially from the seed. The measurements are functions of the state vector xk, um, where mk is the measurement at detector layer k, and h is the, the dependency of mk on the state vector. And gamma k is the difference between the theoretical prediction of the measurement and mk, the actual measurement. To update the step, so then we want to update the state vector using our measurement. So we don't know that these hits are necessarily better than these hits. Why should these hits why should we take the track parameters from these hits only? So once you've extrapolated and got prediction B, we then observe hit B. And then we want to update the state vector using our measurement in the new detector or the new detector layer. And so these equations here are used to update our track parameters with this additional information. So MK minus HK shown here. Um, is the dependency gamma between the predicted measurement and the actual measurement. And k here, kk, is the common gain. And it's a function of the properties of the noise in the, the detector. And it allows us to weight the importance of the measurement when updating the track parameters, producing a better estimate of the true track. And so the true track is now here. And we'll have new track parameters that we can extrapolate to the next layer. So the filter then uses these adjusted parameters to, to predict the next location of the next space point on the track and the process then repeats until you've got a track. So the pros of this are that you can account for noise, multiple scattering and energy loss at each surface. So the things I was talking about before, particles changing their direction because they've interacted with the material in the detector or, or they may maybe emit a photon and change direction slightly, things like that. And the physics performance is very good. Um, but the negative of using a Kalman filter is that the runtime scales very badly with the number of hits. And I'll talk about why this is a particular problem in the next few slides a little bit after this. So ambiguity solving is the next step in, in the tracking process. So all of the realistic combinations of space points have been made, but there are now a number of track candidates where space points overlap or have been incorrectly assigned. So this necessitates an ambiguity solving stage. So the end result, yeah, of the track pattern recognition process is a set of potential track candidates, but there could be more than one space point for a given layer that matches the filter's approximation with multiple track candidates. So this stage is now required. So the ambiguity solving routine first scores track candidates based on a range of quality criteria to quantify the likelihood that a candidate accurately represents the trajectory of a charged primary particle. It rejects lower quality tracks that also share large numbers of hits with the higher quality ones. 
and the score provides a measurement of track quality and derives from quantities such as number of hits, whether there's holes, so detect layers that don't have a corresponding hit, and the momentum of the track fit, um, where a track having a hole is penalized more than a complete track, and also the chi-squared of the track fit is used as well um, to penalize tracks that are badly fitted. Any track that scored zero anywhere in the ambiguity solving stage is rejected. And after the track candidates have been scored and sorted from highest score to lowest, each track is then individually processed. So the track is assessed using ensuring specific requirements are met. And if the track fulfills all these requirements, it's accepted. And if the track has failed any, it's rejected. And a strict down subtrack is created from its unused hits, rescored and inserted into the input track collection again. So the tracks are rejected by the ambiguity solver if the following requirements are not met. So they have, there's a minimum allowed momentum, a minimum number of hits, a maximum number of holes in the track, a maximum number of shared clusters, and a maximum of two tracks can be associated with a hit. So given your processing in order of kind of best to worst track, once, once there's a track that comes through and its hits have already been used by two tracks, that's automatically just gone and not acceptable. So that's the main tracking stages. And as I mentioned earlier, um, there, are, there are reasons that this can't, we need new methods. So the high luminosity LHC is coming. It's a major upgrade of the Large Hadron Collider and it should be operational from 2029. The high luminosity LHC will make it possible to study interesting rare events in more detail because it's increasing the number of collisions by a factor of between 5 and 7.5 um, with respect to the nominal LHC design. And just briefly, so high luminosity basically means high number of collisions. And as you might be able to imagine, this makes the problem much, much more difficult. So there's a thing called pile up and pile up means multiple simultaneous proton proton collisions so if you imagine a bunch of the protons all colliding there's going to be it's likely there's going to be more than one proton that collides and we're only interested in the highest energy collision that happens so early in run one the average number of proton proton interactions per bunch crossing was two so i.e when two bunches cross on average, there would be two proton proton interactions. And these are like, they're still difficult to distinguish, but it's kind of clear that there are two initially here. Late run one, there were approximately 20 collisions, um, individual proton proton collisions per bunch crossing. So this looks more like this is a problem. But in the high luminosity LHC, there's going to be about 200 proton proton collisions per bunch crossing, making the tracking problem very difficult. So just moving on to the next slide. So the Kalman filter-based methods run time scales with order n squared, n squared hits. So that's going to lead to a combinatorial explosion and so a runtime explosion. And the current budget predictions do not cover the CPU needs of current methods. So we need new and or improved methods um, of track reconstruction at the LHC. Um, so there's been lots of suggestions for this and there's it's a very it's a very active area of research in tracking so from a machine learning point of view the problem can be treated in multiple different ways um and there has been this track ml tracking challenge where they basically made a slightly simplified version of the problem and released it as a kaggle competition for machine learning enthusiasts um and there are different ways that people approach the problem but it, most of the winning solutions did end up using a variant of the way that tracking is currently done. So there weren't many winning end-to-end -end methods where you start from hits in the detector and end up with tracks using machine learning. But machine learning can be used to optimize different stages in, in the um, track reconstruction. So for example, the seeding stage could be optimized using, I think one of the winning teams use just a linear regression for track seeding and yeah you can do different things with different steps um, so that's an active area of research and that is what I am now researching um, the final thing that I want to discuss is jet flavor tagging because this is another area that machine learning can be applied to and is very very useful for so as discussed earlier, hadrons can be observed in a detector as a collimated stream of particles, i.e. a jet. 
and jets are the signatures of quarks and gluons produced in high energy collisions, such as the proton-proton interactions at the Large Hadron Collider. And the key to understanding and identifying the jet properties is very, very important because the jets, so when an interesting event happens, often the key signals of that event will come from jets. So yeah, so you see hadrons as these collimated stream of particles, jets, which are seen as tracks in the detector and showers in the hadronic calorimeter. But one thing that you really, really want to note are B hadrons, because B hadrons are often signals of interesting physics events. B hadrons can be seen because they have a really long lifetime um, or a comparatively really long lifetime. Um, and that corresponds to them moving on the order of millimeters in a tracking detector before they decay. So whereas most particles will initially decay at or very, very close to the primary vertex, i.e. where the protons collide, B hadrons will move a considerable distance, a considerable distance before they decay. And they also have a large mass. So that's determined in the hadronic calorimeter. So the identifiers, as I kind of mentioned, are this displaced vertex and this large impact parameter. So the impact parameter is the distance of closest approach to the primary vertex. So basically signaling this long lifetime of B hadrons. And the group that I'm working with at CERN, so the Atlas flavor tagging and tracking groups have been working on an upgrade to the current flavor tagging algorithm. Um, and I'm only going to discuss tagging B hadrons because these kind of make the most sense in terms of tagging the, the other, you can tag the other quarks, but um, yeah, the B ones make the most sense. So the GN1 model combines a graph neural network architecture with auxiliary training objectives in order to determine, to determine the jet flavor. So the model inputs can include jet variables, for example, the combined momentum of the jet and track related variables for each track within the jet. So for example, the curvature or the closest distance to the primary vertex or the number of missing hits of a track. And the inputs are fed into a per track initialization network, which outputs an initial representation of each track. These representations are then used to populate the node features of a fully connected graph network. And after the graph network, the resulting node representations are then used to predict the jet flavor and also these auxiliary tasks such as the track origins and the track pair vertex compatibility. So each node in the graph corresponds to a single track in the jet and the final node output feature vectors from the network are representations of each track that are conditional on all the other tracks in the jet. So the output representation for each track is combined using a weighted sum to construct a global representation of the jet and this, this global representation of the jet is used for jet flavor prediction using a separate feed forward, neural net, feed forward neural network. The other tasks are node classification. So takes as inputs the features from a single output node, i.e. a single track from the graph network and the global jet representation as well. And it predicts the truth origin of the track, i.e. what particle that individual track came from. And then there's the graph classification network here. So that's jet flavor prediction. And then there's also this edge network, which takes basically two tracks and says, do they come from the same vertex? So has the same particle decayed to produce these two tracks? So that takes in yeah, two tracks and would output basically a yes or a no. So that's a summary of the GNN that's used for jet flavor tagging. Um, so yeah, that's just an overview on some of the things we're doing in the tracking and tagging groups and some of the areas where machine learning could be used. Um, but it's definitely an active area of research and there's a lot more that can be done. So thank you all for coming. And do you have any questions? I'd be, yeah. Hi, that's Philippa. That was, um, that was uh, fascinating. Um, there are, are a couple of um, questions here. Uh, Murray, would you like to... Um to uh, pose your questions. Hello, thanks very much for that, Philippa. Um, I will go back. Um, so, yeah, I do have a couple of questions that I would um, like to ask, and I'm approaching this particularly from a broadly non-technical perspective. My grounding is mostly in ethics, and so I'm particularly interested in kind of the, sort of the really technical foundations of the work that you're doing. So if you're talking about using machine learning for tracking the paths of these particles, how was it possible for you to verify the integrity of your initial 
set of training data for training your first generation of machine learning algorithms. Um, and is the algorithm that you're currently using trained on the data from the previous run of CERN? Kind of running backwards through time. Yes, so that is actually something that I should have spoken about um, and I should have put that in my slides. But the training data is actually all Monte Carlo simulated. So the, I mean, we test on the real data from previous runs. So we're not using run three data yet because that's just currently being collected. Um, most of the data that we're using is run two, but the data used to train algorithms is all Monte Carlo simulated. So we know in quite a lot of detail from the physics equations, basically what could happen in a detector. So you're basically using Monte Carlo simulations to simulate, say a Higgs boson decay, you're simulating what could happen in a Higgs boson decay. You're simulating its interactions with the detector. You're simulating everything that could happen in the detector so that you have basically all of the information from that event and exactly what it would look like as you read out of your measurement so that you can train on something that should be pretty much ideal. I mean, there will be slight differences, but I think it's been, a lot of the data has also been adapted to account for this. So the, the training data, should be pretty good um we don't have many holes in the knowledge and also anything that isn't accounted for in monte Carlo, they know the errors on like it's I, I would say the training data is good there's not too much to worry about there thanks very much could you clarify for me um for what a monte carlo simulation is sorry sorry um yes so a monte carlo simulation so if you imagine that all of these events in particle physics are basically governed by probability. So a Higgs can decay to lots and lots of different things. And we know the probability that it decays to, for example, I don't know, a B quark. Um, and we know the probability of that particular decay event happening. So you can run a simulation where it's basically like rolling a dice. And for that one roll of the dice, it might decay to this set of particles. Um, but then if you roll the dice in another time, it decays to another set of particles and the Monte Carlo will kind of roll these dice on a repeated basis. And so the proportion of the events should be relative to their probability of happening, if that makes sense. Um, so you're basically simulating exactly what could happen in the detector and the Monte Carlo bit is just doing it again and again and again so that the probabilities align with the statistics that you're given. Um, in terms of the detector simulations, this is from just like, I guess we've made the detectors so we know how they work and we should be able to simulate them. So it's it's definitely a complex algorithm. There's lots of different algorithms to do this, um, but they've been worked on by lots and lots of people over a long time. I'm not sure about the exact details, but that's broadly how it works. That's great, thank you very much. Um, that makes a lot more sense to me now. Um, if I might ask my second question, Richard, is that okay? Yes, go ahead, go, please. Thanks very much. So obviously one of the things that we're quite concerned with here at the AI special interest group is about public communication and the interaction between sort of political processes and um, artificial intelligence. So if you are looking at the future developments of AI kind of in the immediate future, um, are there any that you're particularly excited about that you think are going to be very useful for your work? And if you were going to speak to the general public, to a non-scientific public, what is the work that you are doing now possibly going to bring to non-physics applications within the general public sphere? Yeah, so this is this is an interesting question, and I think it's something that is very fair to ask. I mean, so there's obviously um, these questions that I put at the beginning of the talk. <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of clicking, sorry. Um, but these these questions are obviously interesting from a physicist's point of view. General public, maybe they don't really care. And that that would be really fair. Um, the thing I I think the first argument that is generally given is when the electron was discovered, they're like, great, that's cool. What's this thing that you discovered? That's not useful. Um, and then, you know, like with that, I, however many years later and electricity is absolutely crucial for a lot of the things we do. So there's there's the first argument of you don't actually know how the things that you discover are gonna be used. Um, so for example, some of the things that have been well discovered or not discovered, but kind of used and developed at CERN, are, for example, like, I think it's like hadron beam therapy that's used, um, I think it's used, 
it's definitely used in, in medical. I think it's used for cancer treatment, but I'm not 100% sure. And obviously hadron beams have been kind of developed at experiments like the LHC. Uh, also MRIs, they've come from the technology um, at the LHC. The Actually the internet was developed as a kind of side thing being used at CERN and touchscreens as well uh, were first developed because they needed to be used at CERN. So I think for me personally, the big argument in its favor is you just don't know what's gonna come out and how it's gonna be useful. And I think with a lot of scientists working on kind of hopefully state-of-the-art technologies, you're gonna get something out that's useful um, and hopefully useful to the wider public. And I think for me, that's what kind of maybe motivates, you know, kind of spending spending this money and of course using this energy on doing this research. The, there's the interest in the fundamental research, which obviously physicists love and the general public, maybe not so much. But I think for me, it's, you don't actually know what, what you're going to find. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I just typed my question. Sorry, I have to ask again. Um, what are your thoughts on the future of circular collider? How do you, how do you, are you excited about that? Or how does it influence everyone there currently? Or Yeah, I think it's definitely exciting. I mean, I guess for me, Personally, it's a long way off. I'm I'm probably I'm excited about the high luminosity LHC because it feels like it's kind of within my sights. Um, but no, that I think that's really exciting. I mean, I should have got a picture of that as well. I mean, it's massive. It makes it makes the LHC look tiny, um, and it's definitely exciting to be able to achieve. So they're basically the set the future circular colliders going up to energies that are much much higher than anything that we've ever achieved. And I think the motivation is well if we don't see these new particles here that we know exist, you have to go to higher energy to be able to produce them. I, I think it's really exciting, um, but I don't have any kind of major thoughts on it, except that I, I think it's really exciting to see what we discover in that. Thank you. <laughs> Philippa, I've got a couple of questions. One, one very sort of uh, down to earth grassroots question. You mentioned the um, physics performance is excellent on one of your slides in relation to the Kalman filter. And I was just trying to sort of um, work out what you meant by that. Uh, uh, I'm assuming you're sort of referring to the sort of um, error correction of the cam filter, but um, please elaborate. Yes, sorry, let me find this slide. Um, yes, yeah, so when, when I said the physics performance it says excellent, I just meant that it's well, I guess, I guess what I meant is it's the the best that we found um, for tracking these particles. And I think the reason, as you mentioned, that it's so good is that you have these things like multiple scattering and energy loss that are probabilist like governed by kind of probability, their random fluctuations, and they they normally, or at least in the multiple scattering case, it's kind of approximately Gaussian. Um yeah. and so the common filter works really well at adapting for those and adapting and allowing for those problems um mm. so you can also do things like for example there's a process called bremsstrahlung, lung um which is when a charge will kind of somewhat randomly or probabilistically just emit an electron and slightly change direction and in other tracking processes it would be hard to model that whereas that can be kind of added into the errors here um, and allowed for in the Kalman filter, which I think is why is why it's deemed to be um, one of the better algorithms that we have for this. Process. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, um, Kalman filters, um, you know, well known and, and and loved and used in in many fields. So um, it's it's great to see that sort of familiar technique used in, used in this context. So my second question is much broader. And it's about these extra dimensions and sort of search for these extra dimensions yeah. and that, you know, are, what are your thoughts on that? And, could, you know, do it, could we even appreciate them as human beings? I, I mean, and that's that's a very good point. So I think the search for them um, or at least the ideas behind the search for them is that in the same way that you, we hope to see dark matter or we, we do observe neutrinos through kind of a lack of anything in the detectors, the detectors are kind of so precise and the events can be reconstruct, reconstructed in ways that we know. So if we see a large amount of missing energy that has to be accounted for somewhere. Um, and so I think the hope is to see this missing energy, if there were 
extra dimensions, you might see these as energy that's just disappeared. Um, right. But yes, I mean, how can we appreciate extra dimensions? I think I personally can't. Um, I can't imagine an extra dimension. I think there's a lot of, I think there's kind of, on the more theoretical side, there are consequences that extra dimensions would have that could be measured. So in kind of, I think I mentioned like precision measurements. Precision measurements rely on the theories we have um, and testing them really, really precisely. And if anything doesn't match, then we're like, right, something's wrong here. And I think that is that's how you would observe things like extra dimensions that otherwise, I don't know how, yeah. Right. If it wasn't for these kind of missing energy or precision measurements and something being wrong, it is hard to imagine yeah, how, how you would. Sure. Anyway. So there's an inference going on. I mean, it's, um, it's amazing that, you know, your physics is so probabilistic in, in nature. Yeah, there's definitely, it's definitely, you, you would have to infer the extra dimensions. I don't think anyone's hoping to see them directly sure. or at least not at the LHC. Thank you. That's, uh, that's great. Um, I wonder if we have any more questions from our audience. If not, then, um, Philippa, I'd really like to thank you on behalf of the audience present and, and the IST for um, a really, uh, really great seminar. Um, thank you very much. And, and oh. um, if you enjoyed this seminar, you might not like to take a look at our istonline.org.uk website. Uh, the seminar is recorded and will be posted uh, on YouTube. Uh, thank you all for attending. And we look forward to seeing you at a future seminar. Thank you very much. Goodbye.